Praise the Lord. Father, we come to you today. We thank you for your goodness and your blessings, your mercy. I pray that you protect Pastor and Sister Butler as they're traveling. I pray that you protect all of their family. Keep your hand upon all of them today, I pray. God, those, O oh Lord, like my wife who are sick, would you minister your help to them? Would you strengthen them? God, would you bless? I pray this in Jesus' name. And we do need your divine help. And can everybody say amen? amen. Praise the Lord. Stretch your hand toward Patty this morning. She uh, is battling with MS, and uh, she is dizzy today. Let's pray and ask God to help her. Father, I pray for my sister this morning. God, you know how, Lord, to take care of every aspect of that condition and disease. You are not profoundly surprised by any of it, and you're able to help her with it today. And you're able to give complete healing, and what a miracle that will be. Hallelujah. And all of God's people say amen. amen. Praise the Lord. Bless you. You can be seated. It's good to have you here today, and it's good to have regular guests with us. Great to have you with us today. We're so glad. What a lovely family, and uh, we're glad that you're here and um, the kids, by the way, if, uh, let's see, what ages do we have already going? Uh, Super Church is happening today. Somebody help me. What ages are those? 7 to 11. And then the next class, lower than that, which is 4 to 6. Um, so if you have a kid that is in those ages, and if you're a parent and would just uh, like to go and sit in with them that would be great too I tell you I, I look at what they've done in those classrooms and I wish I was that age for about half a second but uh, they are fabulous and they've done a great job and and uh, look forward to what they're going to do with the youth center and all of the rest of the place let's uh, let's talk a little bit this morning and and I want to begin with discussion, and uh, that helps us all to kind of get on the same page, I think. What does it take for a church, and the word church is a building, it is an address, it's defined by the scripture, it's a body of called out believers. What does it take for a church to be truly effective? Somebody help me. Have to care for people. Go. They gotta have the power of God. Not gonna be much of a church without the power of God working in them. Some are trying, seemingly. They have to be faithful. They have to be genuine. You have to be real. Prayer. Friendly, okay. You wearing masks causes me to not be able to hear. Fearless. Fearless. All great answers. Okay, it has to have effective leadership. Well, one of the things I want you to think about. Today around the country, there will be football games played. And uh, a few of the stadiums now let people back in. And so there will be 22 men out on the field. And there will be thousands in the bleachers watching. Okay, God never intended for his church to be a spectator sport. And the people who become most easily disenfranchised with the church and with their participation or their being part of a church are the people who are in the bleachers. While you're in the bleachers, you're disconnected from the reality of participation. You're not part of the game. 
And it's never been God's intent. It has always been his intention that the church be perceived. Remember that definition, a body. Well, this man has a body. And if you take off this arm, he is a less effective body. He needs that, particularly he is a mechanic, an expert diesel mechanic, best in this part of the country. You tell your boss I said that, and you need a raise. But now he would be seriously handicapped if he did not have that part of the body. God has put no people in his church with the intention of them being observers. He has intended that all of us fulfill some role of responsibility. And it's interesting, he has not made us alike. Each of us are different, and that is by divine intent. Uh, The universe could only handle one guy like me. It doesn't need any duplicates of me. It could probably only handle one of you. Each of us are different. Each of us are distinct. Did I hear some wives saying amen and nudging their husbands? Perhaps saying it in regard to their husband. Not every person in in all of this is going to be a leader, not going to be a pastor, not necessarily an influence of others or to have a role that is seen and noticed. As a matter of fact, there are many people who do not want to be seen. They do not want to be noticed. They do want to be appreciated, but they don't want somebody to put them on the stage and herald anything that they have done. But for the church to be effective, it has to have all of the things that you described. And it's got to work together It has to have prayer. It has to have friendliness. It has to have compassion. It has to have all of the things that you listed. But not each of us are as effective in one aspect of that as another will be. Now, none of us are allowed to be prayerless. None of us are allowed to be unfriendly. None of us are allowed to say, well, we don't need the power of God. That's not, but there's going to be some people who, it is their passion to get acquainted with every single new person who walks in the doors. They want to know their dog's name before the person leaves. It's just the way they're bolted together. And there are other people that a cursory hello and glad to see you, Danny, and boy, the cowboys stink, don't they? (laughs) He wears that cowboy's cap around sometimes, so I can razz him about it. (laughs) No, there wouldn't be any reason to argue it. We're going to start in the book of Numbers today, and it gives an example of something important. And the book of Numbers uh, records Israel getting organized. Everybody say organized. At some point, you have to have some organization to be effective. God is not anti-organization because the sun continues to come up in the east and go down in the west. And there continue to be the four seasons. And there are so many other things that God does by system the opposite of things being done systematically is chaos that's interesting that the antonym for order and structure and system is chaos so either you have things in order or you have chaos now i've said to some of you that um in my several years of pastoring, uh, this is the most chaotic a church I've been involved with has been in almost 40 years. 
And there's a number of reasons. One is being a year in that gym. Another is being just out of place, didn't have classrooms, didn't have, couldn't plan for any special events. It's just kind of holding on till things get better. But now it's time for us to find ourselves, similar to where they were in the book of Numbers, where they're getting structured, they're getting organized for the activity of moving from Mount Sinai into Canaan. And as they are learning how they're going to do this, there is a positioning of the certain tribes. This tribe moves out first. Judah goes first. And then there is another tribe and another and another. And there was the tabernacle as it moved. It was to be right in the middle of all of it. And then there were to be six tribes behind it. And then when they camped, the tabernacle was to be right in the midst of it. So there was a positioning. And there was instruction given in the taking down and the setting up of the tabernacle. And all of that was detailed. All of it was detailed. But you can have all of the details you want, but if you don't have people to carry out the details, you can dream big dreams, but if you don't have money and bodies to get stuff done, it's just not going to happen. Can I get an amen? So Numbers chapter 3 and the Numbers chapter 8 detail what happens with a tribe that is known as the tribe of Levi. Um, and in order to stand, understand, and I, I realize there are people here who have vast biblical knowledge, there are others perhaps who this explanation will be needed. Uh, the, the nation of Israel was divided into 12 different tribes, and these were descended from Jacob. And uh, the tribe of Levi is descended from one of Jacob's sons by the name of Levi. Aaron was part of the tribe of Levi. Moses was part of the tribe of Levi. Levi. And now we pick it up in Numbers chapter 3, and we're going to go to verse 6 first. And the Lord said, Bring the tribe of Levi near and present them. They were to present the entire tribe, the entire clan, before Aaron the priest, that they may minister. Now, the word minister means to attend to or contribute. They were to contribute or to attend unto him, and they shall keep his charge. The word charge could have been translated custody or care. They will take care of things as he asked them to, and the charge of the whole congregation before for the tabernacle of the congregation to do the service or the work of the tabernacle. Now, there are several things that are important to get as you begin to think about the way a church works. This did not make Aaron a superior person. It simply meant that God had him in this unique role that he and his descendants were going to be priests. But there would be times in Israel's history where both Aaron and the descendants of Aaron would be unfaithful to their priesthood and not accomplish what God had positioned them to do. There would be times when people who were of the tribe of Levi but were not priests would be equally unfaithful to what God had called them to do. So it doesn't make Aaron superior. It doesn't make him super holy. It doesn't make him without uh, without there ever being questions in his behavior, in his decisions, but it did identify roles that of necessity had to be filled. Now, there's some things that are not of necessity, but then there are other things that are not options. They have to be filled. They have to be done. I think it's also important to notice that they did not just keep the charge of Aaron, the care and the custody of Aaron and his needs and situations. But the scripture adds to this that they were to keep the charge or care or custody of the congregation. So it wasn't that Aaron was going to be this grand imperial 
individual who just kind of was the, 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 the dogmatic dictator of their behavior. But instead, they had their responsibilities did not just affect Aaron in his priesthood, it affected the entire congregation. That's an important observation. None of us in our role of service and ministry, none of us in the things that bring us from the bleachers and put us on the field, none of us do this for pastor. None of us do this for some other person in leadership, but it is done because we're part of the body of Christ and we interact together and we need each other. I need you and on occasion you need me. And it's that recognition, it's that understanding that we keep the charge. Okay, now moving down to verse number 9. And thou shalt give, everybody say give, you shall give, we've just come through a time of giving, a season of giving, you shall give the Levites unto Aaron and to his sons. They are wholly given unto them. And it's the exact same Hebrew word. Some of you have heard me say it. Anytime there is a repetition of a Hebrew or Greek word quickly in a paragraph or in a sentence, it is an indication of the strength of the intent. It was God's intent that everybody understand that these had been given to this particular purpose, that they were given to serve, to keep the congregation and to serve Aaron. Now, move down to verse 12. And I, behold, now this is God talking, behold, I have taken the Levites from among the children of Israel Instead of all the firstborn that openeth the matrix among the children of Israel, I'll explain that in a minute. Therefore, the Levites shall be mine. So they did not become peon serving Aaron, but they were mine, God said. This belongs to me. And as people have decorated and as they have done the things around here for Christmas and as this entire building has been painted and sound equipment has been improved and carpets been put down and buildings been cleaned and cleaned and recleaned and cleaned some more, as all of those things have happened, we need to realize that it is that we're doing it because we are His. Okay? God said, okay, they're going to serve Aaron, but let it be understood that they are mine. You know what? That helps all of us when whatever God's called us to do becomes burdensome. And at times it does. Whatever you're asked to do. Every Sunday school teacher, there comes that Sunday when they're saying, oh, oh Lord, help me. I hate kids today. And it is only because they know that they've been given to the Lord that they walk back in that class and they do yet again what it is that God has gifted them and qualified them to do. They are a gift unto the Lord. Those who work in hospitality, it's the same situation. There are times when we don't want to be in those roles but the Lord says they're mine they're mine now verse 13 gives a bit of explanation about the whole business of the firstborn because all the firstborn are mine the Lord said for on the day that I smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt I hallowed unto me all the firstborn in Israel both man and beast mine shall they be I am the Lord and so the firstborn of the beasts clean beast that the Israelites had were offered as a sacrifice to the Lord. He got the first. The first fruits of harvest were brought to the Lord as gifts of offering during one of their festivals. But these Levites became the substitute sacrifice for each family of Israel, instead of 
me designating my oldest son lame and saying, now God, here he is, he's yours, instead of you devoting your eldest son, instead of each family sending their son to serve at the tabernacle and later in the temple, the Levites became the substitute and in this they feel a role of sacrifice for the nation of Israel. They left the normal of their life. They were not given a space to say this land belongs to the tribe of Levi. Instead they were scattered throughout all of Israel and they were responsible to maintain the cities of refuge and the highways that led to the cities of refuge. They didn't really get to have a spot to call their own except a number of cities scattered all throughout the land. They were distinct, they were different, but in being distinct and different, there were also some sacrifices involved of being separated from your family and of being in one corner of the land and somebody else that you cared about being 75 or 100 miles away. They became for God living sacrifices. Taking the place of the firstborn who would have been the sacrifice brought not to die but to serve. Instead the Levites took that role. They were called to be helpers and they were responsible to carry the furniture of the tabernacle. Others did specific tasks, necessary things, vital and essential. It was not just make work, but it was important work. They were given as workers and they served. They could not do what Aaron did. They could not do what Aaron's sons did. But they had their responsibility. And it would have made Aaron and the other priests jobs much more difficult to be effective if the Levites had not done what God had called and commissioned them to do. Let me tell you something. One of the reasons that churches will stall at times is because that people are not doing their job and their role within the church. And so a leader in the church ends up having to pick up paper and run vacuum cleaners and mow lawns and do things that other people could do. Other people may well be called to do. We have a lady connected with our church that that's what she loves to do. If I were to say to her, come on, I, I want you to sing a song or why, why don't you just come teach next Sunday? She will be sick. But now if you put a vacuum or a broom in her hand, she's good to go. And she doesn't want anybody applauding her participation. She doesn't want her name to be called. That's fulfilling the role. Do you, do you see what I'm talking about? These people took stuff off of Aaron as they were moving from one place to the next and they helped. God didn't want those eldest children put to death. Instead, he wanted these Levites working for him. And whatever the Levites did, it was considered worship. It was service to God. And no matter what work you do for the Lord, whoever hung the wreaths back there, whoever hung those wreaths, whoever's doing the stuff up here, whoever played the keyboard and the drums and all of this, whoever it was before we started today that came and set this down here, everything that you do that helps the work of God go forward is worship. And see it that way. It is not begrudgingly done, but instead with a cheerful anticipation. I'm getting to be part of what God is doing in the land today. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now, let's roll forward to the New Testament church. We have as a backdrop that this premise of service and participation was there. We're going to move into Romans chapter 12. And uh, I will read a little more lengthy than I usually do, but I'll give you a little 
uh, exegeses of the text along the way that maybe help it to not be quite so lengthy. Paul says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. That's very similar to what the Levites were being asked to do, living sacrifice. So he's writing now to church men and church women. And he says to this entire congregation, he's never visited the city of Rome, he's never seen these people in his life, but he knows the issues that we humans have. And writing with inspiration, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now notice what is before called sacrifice is now spoken of as reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do you stay focused on being a living sacrifice? You don't let the world squeeze you into its mold, but instead you are transformed. It's the same Greek word that is referred to when Jesus was transfigured. You are transformed by the renewing. How does it happen? How do you stay fresh in continuing to have a ministry? How do you stay fresh in doing whatever God has gifted you to do? You stay fresh in it by the renewing of your mind. And in so doing, you prove that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given to me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Look at somebody close to you and tell them, you're not such hot stuff. Now, the ones that needed that said to them are not in here right now. I realize that. But don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. But to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Now, it's very important that you hear what I'm about to say. He, doesn't, he says, don't think highly of yourselves. He does not say, think lowly of yourself. Instead, he said, think soberly. And that word is connected with the idea of seeing ourselves in a real, true light. Probably 25 years ago, I realized there were some things I would never be good at. Some folks I know, it dawned on them earlier than that. But on the other hand, there's some things that I know God put inside of me. And so why should I spend my life trying to get better? There's an old story about, and I think this is a fairy tale or maybe a legend from Greece or whatever. Somebody was teaching all the animals and they decided that all the animals needed to have equal ability in everything that they did. And so they had the course. It was swimming and flying and climbing and running. And the rabbit did extremely well at running, but he had a tough time climbing that tree. And the squirrel could climb the tree, but when he tried to fly like the duck, that didn't go well either. God puts in all of us our uniqueness. He makes us what we are. And there's some things that we will never be very good at. And we can go to all the classes we want to. But it still will never really be part of us. But if we think soberly about ourselves, not being proud of ourselves, but knowing ourselves, knowing our strengths, knowing our capabilities... There are certain things that I need somebody to cover my back on because I'm not good at those particular areas. And then for as 
verse 4, for as we have many members in one body, and he's illustrating his point now with a physical body, and all members have not the same office. And the word office is don't have the same practice or act or function. My eye, my ear, my hand, my kidney, my heart, all different roles. And my kidney cannot do what my ear does. They're not interchangeable. Instead, each member is part of this one body. So we, and now he is speaking of the operation of the local church, so we being many, there are a number of us here, and we are one body in Christ. And everyone members one of another. We are interdependent. If I were to take my ear, and God forbid it were just to be cut off and all of the aspects that go with it went along with it and it would just sit over here on the table somewhere, I will have lost something significant to my body. But that ear in its independence will never become better than what it would have been if it had stayed with the body. There's no such thing as Christianity in isolation. There's no such thing as solo saints. I'm just flying by myself out here, and bless God, I'll see you when we get to heaven. I have an acquaintance who has a real passion for a particular area of ministry, and the relationship is getting better and better. One of the next times that we have lunch, I'm going to say to him, son, let me tell you something. It doesn't have to be Calvary, but you're going to have to find a spot to hang your head and to call home. Otherwise, you're never going to be effective doing what you could do for God because you need a body to get it done. So we, as this church, we are one body in Christ, and we are members one of another, having then gifts differing, everybody say differing, according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy. Now, there's going to be a listing here of seven gifts In my estimation, these gifts are distinct from spiritual gifts that are listed in Corinthians, and they are different from another listing of gifts that is in Ephesians, where we're talked about, where it is talked about the five gifts God has given apostles, prophets, pastors, etc. This is a different type of listing. It uses some of the same words as the other listing, particularly prophecy. Here, the word prophecy, it's the same word as is translated having the gift of prophecy or the word of prophecy over in Corinthians, but it is foretale or foretale and then includes having a sensitivity to what's coming. The sons of Issachar in the Old Testament had an understanding of the time. That's not the period there. It is instead a comma, knowing what they should do. So there is a gift of prophecy. And in my estimation, these gifts are motivational gifts. This is what God put into you at your birth. You won't get more of this. You may refine it, and you won't change it. This is what God bolted into you. Remember, the psalmist said, we are fearsomely, fearfully, and wondrously made. Each of us unique. He put something into Candace that he didn't put into Danny, that he didn't put into Christina. Every one of us unique. Every one of us different. What motivates us? You can watch children of a certain age for just a little time and pretty quick you can see what motivates them. And you can watch adults and quickly you can see what 
motivates them. So here's this gift. It is a gift of prophecy, and if you have it, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Or ministry. Now, ministry, a lot of times we say, well, he's a pastor, he's in ministry. That's not what this word means. It means acts of service. If you have the gift of ministry, the acts of service is part of the way that you come together. Let us wait or take care of our ministering. Or he that teacheth on teaching. That's one of mine. Or he that exhorteth, that is to invite, to implore, to comfort, or to coach. He that exhorts, let him take care of his inviting, his imploring, his comforting, and his coaching. Do the thing that God has gifted you to do. He that giveth, and this is a giving above and beyond what others may do. None of us are excluded from giving. Let every man give. All of us are to be givers. But there are certain people that God puts a gift of giving into them. And they will go beyond. And if somebody with a motive, I've watched this over and over. If somebody with a motivational gift of giving actually does and doesn't become carnal with it, they give in abundance and give over and above God blesses them more and more and more and more where that they can give more and more and more and more. They have the gift of giving. And if he gives, and here's something that is instructive, let him do it with simplicity. Let him do it not to draw attention to his giving. And he that ruleth, that's lead and administer. I have a little bit of that. He that ruleth, let him do so with diligence. And the word diligence means speed. And right now I don't feel like I'm fasting much, moving much faster than a turtle on some of this. But, but the scripture says he that is going to lead or administer, you do that with speed. You do that with diligence. You get on with it. And he that showeth mercy... He that has compassion, let him do so with cheerfulness. Don't let being compassionate wear you out. There is compassion fatigue in our world right now because there is so much that is hammered and hammered and hammered and hammered. So your question, and we will come back with a gift test and some other things to follow up on this. I was going to have... Diane White elaborate a little bit on the gifts and how they interact in the process of discovery, but we'll do that at another time. But the question is then, how am I to serve? How am I to serve? Well, it may well be that as I've taught today, you've realized that this is, this is me. This is my identity. This is what is of interest to me. And there are all kinds of places and all kinds of roles that you and I can serve in. But none of us, I want you to hear me, none are excluded from some role of service. You can't be in the church and be in the bleachers. Because the church is this body called out believers it's functioning together a body a body a body i put all of this in a little book years ago called fitly framed and one of the chapters was titled the body of christ has no appendix and i use that title because for years they said the appendix is the one part of the body that has no functional purpose I lost mine as a young man to surgery. I received an email one day from from an Assembly of God African brother. And he was in Africa. And somehow he had come up on this fitly framed stuff. And he was not just a pastor and preacher, he was also a medical doctor. And he said, I enjoyed your material, but you must change that chapter. 
about the appendix. And he went to giving me two or three paragraphs about, it, about what it did. And, and so I changed it. Um, the body of Christ has no useless parts. None of us. Listen, and I've said it for years that uh, if, if a person is looking for a church to just sort of ride rather than participate, there are places that I could recommend but if you want to be part of a healthy church, and I'll say this to those of you who are watching online, if you want to be part of a healthy church, come be part of Calvary. Because a healthy church has people engaged, active, and involved, doing something. Your gift, it may be art. You may love the idea of making the church look good on social media marketing. Please, in Jesus' name, let them be here today. And if that's you, jump up and holler now. Me, yeah! I'm going to take a minute right here on that. I was hoping that it would be like while Peter yet spake. The Holy Ghost fell. If you love decorating, we got 37,000 square feet around here now. We used to have seven. If you like painting or landscaping or keeping the jungle cut back, we spent hundreds of hours tearing the jungle out out here. If you love to make sure things really look good, clean the church. A few weeks into the coming year, we'll start ministries on Sunday afternoon to develop parenting skills, anger management, and help people overcome addiction. We'll need help on all fronts. We'll need help on all fronts. If you love to cook breakfast, Pastor Butler and I have this vision of a person's third visit, including breakfast, being something that includes breakfast with the pastors and the pastor's wives. Well, it's going to be hard for us to get acquainted with those people who are our new friends and be checking on the biscuits at the same time. I feel like praising, praising Him. These nine acres. It's winter now. Spring's coming. With cutting the grass and weed eating. You realize how long it takes to cut nine acres of grass with about a 25 inch mower? But the main focus is get people here and then keep people here. Because that's evangelism and disciple making. And part of disciple making is helping people then find their place and role in ministry. I'm at 11.15. I am supposed to quit. I will take one minute for questions. Any questions? If you'd like a copy of my notes, you can have those. Just email me, carltoncoonsenior at gmail.com. They may be able to put that on the screen or not. But... Um, any questions or comments, woe is me. Pastor, can you give me the name of some of those other churches where I can just go sit? <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's stand together. Father, I thank you for the people in this room today. I thank you for the families that are here. and You've blessed us, my Lord. I, I can't believe how you've blessed us. This has been an incredible year on so many fronts god i thank you for what's here today and when i look at the talent when i look at the giftings when i look at the uniqueness of what each person in this room brings to you god i see the makings of a uh, of a church that is beyond the norm something that can take this city something that can influence and impact and grow and develop and nurture and I thank you for that. I don't, want to be, I don't want to get in the way 
of what you want to do. I don't want to be a hindrance or an obstruction. Help me, God, to follow you and please you in Jesus' name. Amen. For about the next 15 minutes, over there is our fellowship hall, and there's coffee 